Oh, uh, thank you, Matthew, for uh, introducing me. Um, it's great honor to talk here as a first speaker. Uh, today, I would like to introduce our recent activities and uh, the, our conventional uh, trials. Um, today's talk based on mainly our recent project, JST Crest Agribit Data, uh, that's sponsored for our recent uh, study. Um, we have a common difficult problem in omics sciences. Um, that is, uh, for example, uh, degree of freedom is a kind of a dimension of data. It's uh, much larger than number of samples. We are short of number of samples. Um, to uh, find uh, knowledge, we have, we, we have to solve this problem. Uh, the degree of freedom must be smaller than number of samples. To make this, uh, we can uh, introduce, for example, uh, collecting time series data, uh, scale out in data harvesting, and the data assimilation of models. So uh, these, uh, these uh, factors can uh, decrease number of de degree of freedom. Um, about uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, I have started for phenotyping study. Uh, on that time, we don't have uh, such terminology. Um, I have developed a computer control growth chamber for phenotyping. Uh, it can control air temperature, humidity, air pressure, and so on. And it can measure uh, photosynthetic rate and the growth rate in real time. And by using this uh, equipment, I could, I could find a new finding. Um, uh, plant uh, physiological system is very complicated. It, uh, so um, changing environment uh, makes chaotic response of photosynthetic rate. I could find uh, it by using uh, time series data. Um, this is very impressive uh, for uh, modelers. Um, um, input uh, is a very uh, rigid, and, but uh, results, uh, out response is very complicated. But this is deterministic. By using a model, we can predict uh, this, this kind of very fluctuated response. Um, this is based on the theoretical issue. Uh, it's an uh, embedding, embedding theorem. It's proposed by uh, Tarkins. Um, time series data is very important for phenotyping. If we could get um, time series data of observable elements, we can determine this dynamical system perfectly. This uh, embedding theorem is very useful for us. Um, for uh, scale out of equipment, recently we can use a very cheap uh, growth chamber. For example, recently Japanese Okinawa cellular companies released this kind of uh, uh, cheap uh, growth chamber kit. And also in uh, MIT Media Lab, they are developing a city farm. Uh, they call it uh, open AG or sometimes a food computer. Anyway, they are uh, gross chamber. So introducing these kind of cheap equipments, we can uh, get data in parallel. But it's limited. Uh, I would like to emphasize uh, scalability. Uh, we have two types of scalability. First one is the scale up. Um, equipment is uh, bigger, it, we are making bigger. Uh, like uh, recent supercomputers. And we have another one, uh, scale out. Uh, it can be a uh, low cost, uh, for tolerant, like uh, data center. In Google data centers, we have a lot of PCs. It's very for tolerant and uh, economical. Uh, this scale out approach is better for uh, field phenotyping. Uh, so to do it, we have started the project to uh, develop uh, uh, field sensor networks. First, I uh, developed a prototype, and uh, second, it's complicate, uh, com completed uh, 2003. 
Height is very local, so only one. It includes many sensors, such as the humidity, uh, air temperature, CO2 concentration, and the Wi-Fi communication devices, and so on. It's uh, durable, uh, so we can deploy uh, field server in many sites, so it can perform um, sensor, field sensor networks automatically by using uh, Wi-Fi mesh networks. So uh, later, we needed to de uh, develop many kinds of uh, field server for different purposes. Um, uh, for example, these are two cameras for 3D measurement. Um, it has uh, eight cameras for uh, omni uh, images. So, uh, by, uh, we, uh, after all, we deployed many field servers in the world. So we could get a lot of data. Uh, already we have uh, more than 100 million files. It includes image files, environmental data. Um, as already we have uh, agricultural big data. So we would like to get new knowledge from this big data. So, but, but uh, it has not uh, enough metadata. So we need to annotate all files to make metadata automatically using artificial intelligence, such as uh, deep learning. However, uh, only sensor networks is not uh, sufficient to collect comprehensive field data. So, for example, in uh, open fields, um, researcher uh, every day must measure uh, by hand the height of plants. So we should make a new method. So we are now developing new universal method for field phenotyping, uh, introducing other devices such as the drones and the uh, uh, robots. So I would also like to uh, introduce this, this kind of recent uh, activities. So, all, but this field uh, data harvester should be uh, scalable, scale out, and low cost and long term and uh, autonomous. So. I introduced four uh, issues, sensor networks, robots, drone, and computing, computing for analysis. First is a sensor network. Um, final version of field server is very cheap by introducing uh, hardware, uh, open source hardware and open source software, and the recent progress of technology uh, to fabricate. Uh, we call it a personal fabrication. It's kind of a DIY, do it yourself. Uh, by combining these uh, low-cost technologies, we can create a uh, field server in low price. Um, I estimate the cheapest price is uh, 30 US dollar, and the best one will be uh, 1,000 US, uh, US dollar. Um, uh, moderate, uh, middle class is, middle class specification is uh, this picture. Uh, GPS module, solar panel, battery, uh, soil temperature sensor and the soil moisture sensor and so on. Uh, it can tweet automatically on Twitter. So we don't need to prepare servers. We, we can uh, share the data in real time. If you follow our sensor, you can see the field data. Okay, and uh, uh, for robots, uh, about uh, five years, uh, six years ago, we have studied a mobile field server. A field server is fixed, but sometimes you have to move to other place for spraying. It's troublesome. Uh, for scale out, it must be automatically moved. So we uh, introduced Hexalex robot as a uh, mobile mechanism of field server. Uh, after all, it, it uh, was realized as a WOT. WOT is new terminology instead of IoT. Uh, IoT is the Internet of Things. WOT is a web of things. On website, uh, it, uh, this robot has a website. On uh, that website, we can control the motion uh, by using browser. So AI can control instead of uh, operators automatically. And uh, it, can uh, it can be controlled by, uh, via Internet, and it can move smoothly. It's very slow and overrun. Uh, rough fields, and it can be keep vertical. It cannot work. Oh. On this piece, it cannot work. Uh, it can start consuming no power as a field server. 
Uh, this is a user interface of website in this robot. And it's had, we can introduce a, a low cost manipulators on the mobile field servers for microscopic imaging and sampling. This is, these pictures are sampled uh, by using these uh, manipulators and uh, microscopes. We can get uh, microscopic phenotyping. And uh, recent uh, commercial uh, manipulator is very, very cheap. For example, in Shenzhen, China, we can buy uh, this kind of uh, manipulator. The price is uh, 350 US dollar. And also, in Kickstarter, we can purchase very, uh, it cannot work. Oh, on this PC, uh, all movies cannot move. Um, we can uh, buy a similar one in low price. Okay, and the third is wrong. Um, ah, this, this is can, this is also not work. Wow. Well, in, in fact, it must work. <laughs> uh, in uh, to, 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 to measure uh, precisely, um, for example, in millimeter order accuracy, uh, to measure uh, three-dimensional uh, shape of plants, we need uh, a low altitude flight. And uh, if we uh, choose a uh, one meter altitude, uh, the downflow uh, shape the uh, plants. So um, anyway, uh, plants are fluctuated by natural winds and the downflow caused by the drone. And uh, uh, to, to uh, precisely, we measure the three dimensional shape uh, photo must be taken simultaneously from multiple direction from 3D measurement. Okay, so at least we need three drones. Uh, simultaneously, uh, these drones uh, can take picture by using a ZUB network. Oh, it can fly. Uh, formation flight. <laughs> it's very impressive. So three. <laughs> Three drones can fly and take picture. <laughs> wow. Well, if you are interested in this picture, uh, later I can show you uh, personally. <laughs> OK. Um, and uh, recently, a uh, Chinese company, uh, DJI, released a uh, mattress. Uh, it has a small, uh, low cost RTK GPS module. Uh, it uh, has a uh, function of uh, precise positioning. Uh, centimeter order, uh, maximum error is uh, three centimeters. So yeah, to, to produce this system, we need uh, original distance sensors. But uh, by using uh, RTK GPS, easily we can uh, control the position. So we can take picture, uh, the best uh, situation. Uh, so. Uh, however, uh, we, we, we bought first version. It has a lot of bugs. So current firmware cannot record precise positioning data. Uh, to uh, accurate 3D reconstruction, we need the position. Uh, so we, if you want to buy this one, uh, you should wait uh, for at least uh, half a year. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, computing for analysis. Uh, we have several methods for analysis. Oh, it can, I, maybe this is a zip file. Uh, by using a sensor networks, we can uh, harvest uh, this kind of data. And uh, by using drone, uh, we can get uh, many pictures. So, but these are image. These are not numerical data. For uh, analysis, we need a numerical data uh, for environmental data, uh, uh, only uh, using sensor network, directly we can get uh, numerical data such as uh, temperature, uh, humidity, and CO2 concentration. And uh, by metagenome uh, genome technologies, we can con uh, collect uh, metagenome data for uh, plant microbiome. Um, manipulator can take a sample automatically, I hope, in the future. Um, so the problem is the uh, image. These uh, data are not uh, numerical data. So we need a uh, technology for datafication from image data. Uh, 
By using uh, um, Reconstruct 3D software, we can make 3D data. But still, it's not a numerical data. So by using machine learning pattern recognition system, we can get, uh, we can extract numerical data. So uh, we can use uh, environmental numerical data, meta genomic data, uh, time series data, and uh, numerical data uh, extracted from uh, images. So combining uh, these data, uh, we can uh, solve, uh, for example, difficult problems, and uh, we can share the data on Twitter. Uh, if uh, AI can find uh, interesting something. Okay, so um, I choose a sample problem to uh, check this kind of system. Um, uh, as my uh, in interest, uh, I would like I would wanted to solve a mystery of hybrid bigger from uh, two domains. Uh, first domain is my domain. Uh, from information science, I can uh, propose a logical model. As um, hybrid bigger is very curious uh, from the uh, science of information. Uh, for example, a weak and slow chess program is uh, further. And a weak and unstable chess program is mother. By using hybrid bigger, we can get strong, fast, stable uh, chess program. It's very interesting as a computer science. It's very difficult. Um, but in biology and agronomy, we are very familiar to hybrid bigger. So by using big data, uh, my colleague, uh, he's a, a breeding scientist, uh, he can get uh, uh, new knowledge uh, from big data. And I can uh, uh, offer uh, logical models from computer science. So combining these uh, two uh, hypotheses, uh, we can get a solution of hybrid bigger. Um, we are halfway uh, accomplishing this uh, project. And uh, this is second sample problem. Um, in uh, uh, plant tissue and cells, there are many uh, microbiome. Uh, so by a metagenom, a metagenom, we can get a time series data for plant microbiome. For example, this is a sample. And this is good bacteria. It's changing like, like this uh, curve. And the bad bacteria is also uh, changing. So this uh, relationship is very comp uh, competitive. Uh, so we have to solve this program by using uh, complex models. Uh, by using machine learning, we can uh, identify unknown parameters in these uh, complex models. And uh, these dynamics are affected by environmental data. So by using sensor network data, we can get uh, com uh, complex models in fields. Uh, for data application, uh, we, are, uh, we employ the deep learning. For example, uh, this is a plant uh, to measure the size uh, of a uh, ratio of uh, pixels. We have to identify plants by using machine learning uh, models. We can identify only plants. And uh, um, physical, physical, physiological event time is also very important data. So by using a pattern recognition, a deep learning system can identify uh, flowering time. And a uh, uh, deep learning system can count the number of uh, head, like the picture. So by using AI, we can get uh, numerical data automatically. However, uh, we must collect a lot of truth data for deep learning. Uh, deep learning requires a lot of uh, uh, truth data. So we must develop truth data harvester, and we must share truth data. Okay, and uh, our, our colleague, our company, NEC, are developing a phenotype viewer, combining our technologies of data fication and the sensor network data. Uh, it has many functions as the admin software. Uh, it's, uh, they start only uh, developing uh, this uh, phenotype VR. Um, it has a function of analysis 4D 
data, uh, for example, 3D and uh, time axis. Um, we have a lot of problems to uh, accurate 3D reconstruction. So we have to solve uh, many problems. And for uh, modeling, uh, we have proposed a complex model based on uh, generalized logical volta equations. It's nonlinear equations. Uh, it can represent uh, complex systems. So uh, you can choose a unit of this system, environment, plant microbiome, soil microbiome, fruit, uh, leaves, stems, roots. These units are completely relationship. So on this generalized logical volta equation models, we can identify unknown parameters, such as the interaction between environment and the fruits, environment, leaves, and or relationship between fruits and uh, leaves, and so on. Okay, so we have a big problem to solve this unknown parameter, to identify an unknown parameters of this model. We need uh, uh, big computational resources. We can, but we cannot rent for data center like Google researchers. And we cannot occupy supercomputer. We are not so rich uh, institute. So instead of a supercomputer and a data center, we have to uh, prepare something. I, I uh, employ uh, metacomputing instead of supercomputer and uh, uh, data center. Uh, we, in our institute, university, we have a lot of spare PCs. So by using, by combining uh, spare time of PCs, we can solve big problem. Uh, about that, uh, 10 years ago, we had a uh, 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 project such as uh, uh, not, uh, SETI, SETI at home. It, um, by using uh, big data, uh, we tried, uh, they tried to find a, a signal from uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, planets. Uh, on that time, they could get big uh, computational resources. So by the uh, same manner, we are trying to use metacomputing for uh, solving a complicated model. At the beginning of uh, this project, we uh, developed a metacomputing JavaScript program, a program uh, on SNS. And, uh, this program is for uh, data assimilation of uh, by machine learning to solve that uh, complex models. Uh, if you uh, follow this uh, user, GraphBot0004, this is AI system uh, and the JavaScript program. Uh, this is the data and the parameter, and uh, this is the uh, best uh, candidate of models. So we can share the problems and the best solution in real time. And uh, this program, uh, based on genetic algorithm to uh, find uh, unknown parameters. Okay, uh, this is summary and conclusion. Um, scale out and uh, time series data are key, keys for phenomics. And the concept of data harvester is proposed. We have, we have to solve a lot of problems to make uh, real data harvester in fields. Um, RTK GPS drones can be a uh, breakthrough. Uh, we don't need to uh, difficult uh, sensors. Uh, only RTK GPS, we can solve a lot of problems. Uh, but currently, uh, firmware is incomplete. We should wait for uh, at least a half year. Uh, big data is created by datafication. Datafication is very important for uh, to get numerical data. And from image data, we can get numerical data. And the sharing of truth data for machine learning is very important. We should share by using something. And metacomputing is available in phenomics. We examine the power. And we estimate big data allow to find knowledge automatically and to solve difficult problems such as uh, hybrid bigger. Thank you.
you very much. No, please stay, please stay. We're going to ask. That was excellent. Um, questions. We have five minutes for questions, so please be willing to field some. And here we have a mic, and then we have a question from Michelle. Um, can you just um, define truth data? Uh huh. Um, for example, um, we have a very uh, many data such as uh, uh, image of rice, wheat. So, the, in the in the scene of the picture, there are many uh, plants, weeds, and crops. So we have to uh, show this area is rice. This area is a. Uh, uh, weed. This area is a uh, background. So, um, by using mouse, we have to indicate the real uh, uh, place. So that is uh, first uh, truth data. And uh, um, by using sensors, we can automatically get uh, data such as uh, uh, air temperature and the humidity and so on. Um, I'm not too familiar about yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm not too familiar about the uh, Lotka Volterra uh, equations. Is it something like a path analysis, or ca can you explain the principle? Ah, so that complex model. Yeah. Uh, Is it based on uh, on on correlation between parameters or? Uh, yes. Um, in, 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 in in medical science, they use uh, uh, pathogens and. Uh, uh, microbiome relationship, uh, they, uh, they model uh, using, uh, for example, uh, same as my mana, generalized loss coverage equations. It's a nonlinear uh, differential equation, very complicated. But is it the same principle as a path analysis? Or? Uh, yeah, but, but it's not stable, it's a dynamical. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much for your talk. And uh, my name is Ji. I'm coming. I'm coming from Early Ming Student JIZ. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing very similar things like you are doing, particularly uh, in field service stuff mm -hmm. style. The question I want to ask is: When you scale scale things up, um, firstly, how will you transfer all these imaging data as well as the sensor data back to on on site server or computer? The second question is. When you scale things up, obviously you have, so if you want to cover the whole field, you will have hundreds of these nodes. How are you going to control um, the, net, the, 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 the mesh network as well as centralized and distributed computing? Oh, I, I can uh, hear. First question. The first question is basically how you transfer these large data uh -huh. from the field back yeah. to on-site work, workstations. Uh -huh. The second question is how are you going to um, well, conducting distributed computing uh -huh. as well as centralized computing, okay. but particularly for trace analysis. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, as, as for the first question, uh, we, we as firstly, we choose the uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is very, uh, broadband. So in, uh, only by Wi-Fi, we try to send the data from the field to the computer. But uh, later, we can use uh, 4G, LTE. So it's enough to send uh, big data from the field to uh, computer center. Uh, OK. Um, so how about the second question? Particularly yeah. when you scale things up, presumably you have very wide, or very good Wi-Fi coverage as mm -hmm. well as 4G coverage. Yeah. Then if you have hundreds of nodes in the field, how are you going to um, implement the yeah. mesh network? to mm -hmm. control distributed computing yeah. analysis on every single node as well as centralized computing? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, that's a very difficult question. It, uh, uh, for example, uh, this is an open field server. Um, by using LTE, we can send data. So uh, we don't have a data center. So it only treats data on Twitter server. So we don't need a center for uh, data storage. So, um, personal computer, it, users personal computers can uh, collect data from Twitter server. So, and uh, uh, analysis is another problem. 
so we are trying to uh, develop uh, soft utility. Um, yeah, it should be quick. Uh, um, the datification of uh, image data, which yeah. I think critical function in all of this. Um, are you doing that mainly through metadata, or is it actually geometric analysis uh -huh. of the image itself and creating a matrix from the geometric data? Uh, um, geometric data, uh, do you mean the position? Um, for example, um, a sensor node has a, a GPS. It has a GPS. So if we can get the, this sensor uh, is located here, and uh, this picture is taken is here, uh, geometrically we can identify. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, only add on, it's very difficult. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. need, uh, this kind of sensor. Thank you very much. I think we should probably end it in the interest of time, and I don't see a lot of hands up anyway, so you'll be around for the next uh, day or two. Yeah. Well, let's thank again Dr. Hirafuji for that excellent talk. Okay, so our next keynote speaker is Ose Jimenez Bernie, a.k.a. Bernie, and... Uh, where are you? Yeah. Okay, so brief introduction. So Bernie's a research scientist at CSIRO, CSIRO in uh, agricultural food in Australia, where he leads the research team, Translational Phenomics and Services, at the High Resolution Plant Phenomics Centre. And before that, he was in the Marine and Atmospheric Research Centre, also at CSIRO, and originally graduating from the University of Cordova in Spain. So he's basically using a combination of uh, remote and proximal sensing tools, such as hyperspectral and thermal imaging, chlorophyll fluorescence and laser scanning for the non-invasive monitoring of, of crop physiology on large populations in the field. So uh, Bernie, please come and teach us about this. <coughs> Well, now I'm a bit scared with the video, so hopefully it plays this time. Uh, but anyway, we do our best. Uh, yeah, for me, it's a great honor to be here today in CIMIC. Uh, um, and have the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing in Canberra. And I guess, um, um, especially talking about field phenotyping, which seems to be a high uh, uh, topic in the new survey, and especially how we apply that to crops such as cereals. So I guess for most of you, this, uh, you, are many, uh, you are very familiar with this type of environment, this type of field uh, experiments that are grown all over the world, like uh, probably the thousands of these all around, where people are performing phenotyping. Um, it's great to be here in CIMIT, where a lot of the measurements in phenotyping were uh, that drove the green revolution were relatively basic, like you just need like a ruler um, steak knife to get biomass cuts and obviously the yield at the end. So the question uh, I made myself when I started working in this field is, uh, can we replace these really basic tools such as the ruler or steak knife with lasers or some like uh, more 21st century technologies? Um, unfortunately, the, the technology is not going to be like this. So the lasers and robots that we can apply are not going to be really um, like a science fiction kind of thing. That I've been talking about today, I'm presenting. So it's not that exciting, I know, but I think that the results that are coming from this are quite exciting. So I come to this a little bit later. Um, so I work in what is called the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, uh, um, and that facility has two nodes. It's a, uh, it's a national facility in Australia, which means that it's open to any research in Australia, but also to anyone in the world. Uh, and there's two main facilities, one based in Adelaide, which uh, Bettina and Trevor uh, and Heli are managing. And then there's another facility in Canberra, where I work in, and Savi is the director who is sitting there. 
Um, and really the aim of these facilities is to provide infrastructure for the community all across the scale from the control plants to the uh, environment. So the type of work we do is what we call phenomics from the pot to the farm, really working with single plants, mother plants, and the control environment using uh, either commercial or home developed technologies, um, such as the plant scan that you see in this picture that we developed in Canberra. Then we can move to the next level up using some technologies for phenotyping in mini canopies in control environment, like in the glass house. Um, but really most of the work uh, I've been driving uh, in Canberra with my colleagues is how to apply some of these technology in field trials, how to apply that either to a small or relatively small field trials up to the large scale, uh, kind of commercial scale phenotyping and even how to take some of this technology to the farm scale as well. Um, so we use, uh, we have developed and we use a, an ecosystem of different phenotyping platforms that we deploy under all these different conditions. And like Matthew said, we use a range of technologies that I will be showing today. So something that is also really important to, to consider is uh, all the work we do in phenotyping is all based in this equation of uh, the interaction between the genotype and the environment, and in the case of farming system, the management as well. But you have to keep in mind that these phenotypes are dynamic, and some of them are really uh, highly dynamic. Like, for example, if we're looking into water use and canopy temperature as a surrogate for water use, that will change within seconds. So you need to consider that, either because um, you need to capture that interaction between the genotype and the environment, but you can also use that to your advantage because it means that you can, if you monitor um, uh, with high temporal resolution, you can then resolve the interactions of these genotypes and the environment. Um, and, and that's quite, kind of what we're aiming to. So I'd like to also highlight the importance of uh, the calibration and not just getting pretty pictures. And I guess we see a lot of talks about the use of UAVs uh, and some technologies. And for me, it doesn't really matter what platform we use. We can use ground platforms, we can use area platforms, it can be men, a men, or even a pigeon. At the end of the day, the key thing is how to go from these pictures, uh, these images that we collect, which are basic pretty pictures, into actual physical values, such as temperature in this case. And uh, there's a, a, a range of knowledge and technologies and engineering problems that we need to resolve, such as the uh, acquisition software to make sure the quality of the data that we capture is good enough, but also all the radiometric calibrations and, uh, and different steps to get down to these physical values. But then this, the, the next challenge is really how do we extract these values? How do we um, go from these physical values to the experiment layout, to our genotypes, to our treatments? And, and we have put a lot of effort into that, developing our tools. Uh, because most of the times these solutions are not commercially uh, available these days. So uh, just to start with, uh, oh, okay, so the video is not working. Um, all right. Uh, so just to start with, <laughs> um, can I use my laptop? Because I guess uh, I have some videos that will be a bit of a problem. Okay. Maybe if you get off of the slideshow. Yeah, can you move directly to the video? Uh, Not out of the PowerPoint? No, it's embedded in the PowerPoint. You don't have the file files? Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if you exit from the slideshow, the slideshow. Uh, slide you yeah. yeah. can't use the Mac though because the. Uh, I think the problem is that the videos are in MP4, so it says that QuickTime is not available. No, we see it will be one minute. Ah, you have one already. No, they don't. No, you missed the wrong one. You missed the wrong one. Come over here. I have a room. 
No, no, it has both. Ah, que está grabando a través de okay. All right, here we are now. Sorry about that. I mean, we tried it yesterday, but it may be a different version of, uh, of uh, PowerPoint. So anyway, so we use... Uh, um, we use drones, but we also use full-size helicopters. And the reason for that is that the scale at, at which, what we work, which is thousands of plots, thousands of genotypes, we need to be able to cover that technology. Within, we, we need to be able to cover this experiment within seconds. And that's why we use full-size helicopters to be able to achieve that. And, and, the, and the good thing with this is that we went from, like, uh, heritabilities from... Uh, handheld canopy temperature measurements of about 0.1 to heritabilities about 0.6 just by capturing the whole experiment within a few minutes and eliminating all, all that um, environmental noise. The good thing is also because we use these uh, full-size helicopters, we can cover the entire uh, experiment not just with one camera, but we can fly three different cameras or, or more. So we fly Therma, we fly RGB, and we have, uh, so we can fly a very high resolution RGB camera, which allows us to create 3D reconstructions of the whole uh, field experiment and be able to extract uh, parameters such as canopy temperature or even some basic uh, architectural parameters out of that, which allows us to correct for some of the effects in the canopy temperature measurements as well. We also started flying some of the um, new multispectral cameras that are available right now in the market, which allows us to not just use NDVI, but extract all the spectral indexes that correlate much better with chemical composition, such as chlorophyll content. And um, potentially, because we, we can carry that weight, we could fly hyperspectral um, or any other multispectral technology that will, gi uh, will give us a better insight about the photosynthetic status of all the different plots. But um, as our previous speaker mentioned before, it's really important the, to understand the dynamics and to understand the, uh, um, uh, for me, it's the combination of the spatial information that we can get from these area platforms together with the uh, high temporal resolution that we can get from the uh, sensor networks, for example. So we have been developing different sensor networks. In this case, what I'm showing here is, is what we call the Arduino crops. It's, uh, infrared thermometer that measures the temperature continuously, so we get a measurement every second, average every minute or five minutes, and what they give us is the, re, the, re, the interaction between the, uh, the canopy temperature as a surrogate of water use and the, um, uh, uh, and the environment. So, and this is really important, and the reason why I like this picture here is because um, obviously it would be great to fly a drone or a helicopter every day to to get these dynamics as well, but normally we cannot get that. So the problem is that if we, uh, this shows like three different genotypes selected for different reasons, like low temperature for high transpiration rates, high temperature uh, selected by carbon isotope discrimination, and a uh, um, commercial variety. Uh, what we see here is that with the three different colors, if, if we flew our sensor one day or another day, we would get completely different results. So for example, if we fly this day here just after a rain event, we can see the ranking of our hot and cold genotypes will be very different than if we fly this day where uh, the crop has gone to some water stress and it's probably struggling to get all the water through the crop. So it's really important to combine this spatial and temporal information to get a clear picture of, of this uh, genotype and environment interactions. But if I have to pick what is the next big thing in terms of sensors for phenotyping, for me, it would definitely be the LIDAR. So the LIDAR is a laser scanning system which uh, what creates is a, it measures the distance from the sensor to the crop. And what the LIDAR gives us is a, a, a full 3D reconstruction of a crop that then we can use to analyze that in many different ways. So we can extract 
basic things such as canopy height, but also we can get much uh, a very good estimation of what uh, canopy volume and therefore used as a surrogate for biomass or even more complex traits uh, that I will show in a minute. So what we did is integrate that LIDAR system uh, first into a much bigger platform, but then we end up developing this phenomenal LIDAR you see in the video. So this is obviously just a model of that. So this is a model of that phenomenal that you see in this video. And the reason why we developed this device is that we wanted to make something really portable, modular, cost-effective, so we could make many of these and operate that in different environments. Um, and we uh, did it in a way that would be modular to integrate other sensors apart from the LiDAR. So the standard version of this, we normally operate uh, GreenSeq as a way to measure NDVI because that's kind of the de facto standard for many people right now. But, but also we operate a, a high resolution camera for doing some visual assessment. So the, I think we really did well making something that was portable and easy to operate. Uh, and then it can be run both in controlled environments such as glass house or polytunnel in this case, and field experiments and apply that to different experiments. And a big motivation for that is that we really need to uh, apply this uh, kind of uh, uh, seamless uh, phenotyping technologies across multiple environments. So we work a lot, and Greg will present a lot of uh, some of this work later on in his presentation on what we call the managed environment facility, which is pretty much a, it's a collection of experiments at the different uh, ge uh, geographical locations, but also with ir different uh, levels of irrigation to target different environments. Um, so we need to apply the same phenotyping technology across these environments. Uh, and, and across these uh, locations. But also the problem is that even within each location, we may have four or five or more experiments in different locations in the farm. So we need something that we can put in the back of the trailer, transport it, and being able to measure a few thousands of plots uh, pretty quickly. So for the last few years, oops, we've been um, uh, developing different calibration and validations for some of the traits that we can extract from the LIDAR. So a very simple one, obviously, is canopy height. It's the, the same thing that we measure with the ruler. Uh, so we went there and measured the ruler, uh, the height with the ruler, and then compared with the estimates of height that developed from the LIDAR. And obviously, we got pretty good results. And, and what we found is that the error bars of the LIDAR, when we aggregate by genotype, are much smaller than the error bars that we get for the manual measurements, uh, taking into account that we eliminate eliminate the human factor is where's the, the top of your canopy? If you take different uses, they're going to get different views and different approaches. The other advantage of this system is because it's really easy to operate and really easy to move around. We can operate that on, on a high temporal basis. So we can operate this weekly, twice a week. We could operate every day if we wanted to. And then start getting some of the dynamics and things like growth rates for the different genotypes. And that graph on the right-hand side represents the evolution of different um, genotypes of a, a mutant population and how the evolution of growth is uh, very different and how they end up um, getting different heights uh, that we can monitor with the LIDAR and go from height on different time points into growth rates. But probably the most exciting results come from the estimation of digital biomass based on the LIDAR. So first of all, you need to keep in mind that the LIDAR gives us a a volumetric estimation of the canopy. It's not actual biomass. So what we're really measuring is uh, bio volume. So obviously, this needs to be corrected by other factors, such as the development stage or the canopy density, uh, specifically fairy and things like that. But still, uh, in the experiment that we ran last year, where we had uh, biomass cuts for validation combined with the LIDAR at different uh, developmental stages, we found that we could get a pretty good estimation of uh, the biomass, the digital biomass versus the destructive. So we have developed two different algorithms for the estimation of biomass because what we found is that after a head emergence, obviously uh, all the remobilization will happen from the leaves and the stems to the grain, and the, um, the algorithm we won't pick that up. But by combining information from all the sensors, including hyperspectra, then we are able to combine that and get much better estimation for biomass even POTS and, and thesis. Um, 
And obviously, because it's a 3D image, then we can extract the image and segment the image in a different way that you do with a 2D image. And, and the beauty of that is that then we can start looking at things like uh, extracting the head, start, start extracting the spikes, and potentially quantifying how many spikes we have and even some volumetric estimates of these uh, uh, um, spikes. So uh, our dream really is go to something like a digital harvest index that prevent the whole thing of uh, doing all this destructive sampling in the, uh, in the field. But we are also working on some uh, novel traits that uh, they are very difficult to measure uh, because uh, it requires uh, equipment or they are uh, very time consuming. And a good example of that are some of more complex uh, canopy traits that uh, give us information about the canopy architecture, the leaf angle, or even how the light is distributed inside the canopy. So for example, by um, analyzing the LIDAR point cloud in a different way, we can see how each of these little graphs is a single genotype, and we can see how different they look like. This is kind of a, a, a profile projection of, of, of uh, like a transversal projection of this uh, plot. So you can see the differences in height. You can see the differences in architecture, how, how some of them are more erect than others, uh, how they uh, allow the light to penetrate further into the canopy. But also using the information about the, the laser reflectance, so we use a red laser in this case, then we are able to see how much red light is reflected back from the canopy, which is a really good indicator of the greenness of the canopy, how much chlorophyll is still uh, functional in that canopy. So, so we can use that to model the light interaction in the canopy and also where the light has been used. So by Again, reanalyzing that point cloud in a different way, we can create these profiles, which give us an indication of the leaf area density in the vertical profile of the canopy and how green the canopy is still in that uh, level of the canopy. So uh, what we're aiming right now is to really model the light penetration and compare that with measurements with septometers and, um, um, and light sensors. So again, by using the multi-temporal dimension of this data and going there and running this every week, then we are able to map the evolution of uh, the canopy architecture over time. And using uh, some, uh, the right genetic material developed by Greg Rubeski in this case, we are able to characterize some of these um, near estrogenic lines that differ just on these uh, architecture parameters and follow the evolution uh, around the senescence uh, for this. So we can compare that with other measurements such as leaf area index, um, uh, fractional cover and so on, and look how these different genotypes are evolving very differently, um, for example, when we have irrigation or we don't have irrigation. So we can see for in this case, these are two near isogenic lines for presence or absence of ligules, and how uh, the, the senescent profile, the onset of the senescence is different for the two different uh, genotypes, but also for the two different environments, in this case, irrigated and rain-fed. But the other uh, important thing that we're trying to address right now is obviously uh, these things that we have developed work uh, great at the plot level, but the question is uh, uh, breeders are not interested so much in the plot scale because uh, the feedback that we get is that, well, we're going to harvest that anyhow if we get to that point. So how can we bring this earlier in the, in the breeding process, in the breeding pipeline, um, so we can look into single plants uh, or we can look at single row uh, treatments. And obviously, breeders don't want to do any destructive sampling on that. They want to get something that is non-destructive because obviously you want to keep these seeds if there's something interesting. So we've been looking into how to extract single rows and apply the same algorithms that we supply, uh, apply to the full crop to this single row. And Greg will be presenting some of that uh, tomorrow. So obviously, a lot of the issues that we had during the development of all this uh, 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 ecosystem of tools is how to harness all the information that comes from all these sensors, all these massive amounts of information that uh, we collect in the field. Because yeah, the, the technology oops, uh, is. Uh, uh, oops. Um, the technology, uh, I mean, gives a lot of uh, megabytes and terabytes of data, but also we run that very frequently. So we developed this thing called PhenoSmart, which is 
It's a cloud-based solution that aggregates all the information that comes from all our different platforms, both in the control environment but also in the field. So the idea with FenoSmart is to provide a cloud-based uh, solution that can be deployed in any cloud infrastructure, either commercially available or on-site supercomputer facilities that most of us have available, um, and how to deploy that as a virtual machine that people can upload the data. And the goal with that is um, to provide all these algorithms that we have developed for the use of the technologies that we have developed or use that with third parties as well. Um, so we are in the process of um, uh, partnering with different uh, commercial companies to be able to deploy this uh, uh, for public access to, uh, to different groups. And in terms of the roadmap for the different traits that we have been extracting, so right now we have been validating and getting good results that we are in the process of publishing of some of the traits that we can extract from the LIDAR, such as ground cover, height, biomass, but also uh, for traits such as canopy temperature. There was a paper just published recently on some of this pipeline. Spike temperature, growth rates, uh, some of this is the grain profile that just show right now. And how to combine all that information with all the sources of information such as the canopy temperature and the BI and so on. And that's again something that FenoSmart can provide is that the key thing is how to have all that information in a one-stop shop so we can uh, then query, okay, I have a higher temperature in this genotype, is that because there's a difference in the ground cover for this particular plot? Are there any differences in height? Are there any difference in any manual measurement? Um, and then we're in the process of validating new uh, traits such as state green index combining some of this information, um, spike volume account to potentially go to harvest index. We're looking really hard into how to improve photosynthetic capacity traits non destructively um, and avoiding doing LIGO in the field as well using combination of happy spectra, LIDAR, and so on. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a, a lot of underdevelopment right now that hopefully we'll be reporting pretty soon. So this is just an example of how the processing pipeline looks like in this FenoSmart platform where you uh, upload the data from the sensors and then you go to a web-based system where you analyze the data and extract your information. So this is a, a quick look of some of the data from the LIDAR in the field. And eventually the key thing, the key, what most of the people is interested in is getting this table as a CSV file that then you can link to your experimental design and apply your statistic analysis uh, as you would normally do with any other manual measurements. The other key thing of this Phenomobile uh, light system is that it's really modular, which allows us to integrate all the type of sensors, such as uh, canopy temperature, like a thermal camera, which give us really good information about single plant, single organ temperature, and that's how we can extract some of the spike temperature, or we can do a much better job extracting and separating the, the vegetation temperature from the background temperature from the soil, and things like that. Or if we go to single plant, single row uh, phenotyping, that's what gives us this type of information. We also have a hyperspectral system on that one, which uh, gives us like a, a centimeter resolution pixel of, of almost millimeters with three, four, uh, 340 bands, um, which is really useful for some of these uh, photosynthetic trait uh, uh, extraction or even chemical composition. Um, the problem with the happy spectra, as uh, some of you may be experiencing if you have one of these, is how to deal with the massive amount of information that we collect from that. Just to give you an idea, this system, uh, which is just a single camera, gives us one gigabyte per minute. So just to move around the data, just to process that data is a big challenge. So what we're trying to do is put in place some mechanisms to reduce the data throughput and just simplify the information that we get from the field, so to make that data more accessible to everyone. But I guess there's a lot of uh, as well going on into how to bring phenomics beyond just phenotyping in breeding trials. And a lot of what we're doing right now is how to export or translate some of this technology to other crops. So we developed a version of this phenomobile that is applicable to grapevines. And instead of scanning from the top, we scan from the side. We give us a really good 3D model of the canopies that then we can apply for the management of uh, <laughs> pruning uh, strategies and, and decision support in, in grapevine industry. Um, we're looking into canola, we've been uh, looking into targeting weeds as well, using LIDAR as a way to map uh, weeds in a much better way that you can do with uh, all the sensors currently available. And then we have even tried LIDAR from the air as a way to 
see the detail of the information and apply that at a much bigger scale. And obviously, the same methodologies that we apply to start the temperature, for example, at the crop level, to start the reflectance at the crop level, we can apply that to start at the full, uh, like a single tree level in a tree orchard, um, or you know, or, or segment that in a, every square meter of a farm, uh, with the problem of the scale, obviously. So I'd like to finish acknowledging uh, all the people involved. That this is not this is the result of a big team of a multidisciplinary team at the high resolution plant phenomics in Canberra uh, that has people from different disciplines like mechatronic engineers, software engineers, uh, plant scientists and so on. Um, and all the collaborators in Cicero and outside Cicero as well. And obviously I'd like to acknowledge our um, Jedi master, uh, Bob Farman, who kind of started this thing and, and took us to the, uh, to the right side of the force as well. So may the force be with you. So thank you very much. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Yeah, we can Good morning, I'm Maina Sara, a biotech stress phenotyping spe specialist with CEMIT. Uh, thank you, Jose, for a very nice presentation. I have two quick questions. The first one is regarding the phenomobile. Yep. Um, how, how is the data quality affected by the, the speed of operation? Yep. If I'm an operator, if I'm moving the, the, the platform uh, a different speed, how is the data quality affected? Yep. The second one is regarding the LiDAR system. Um, I guess the, the precision is high when you have large plots. What, what, um, what do you expect when you move to very small plots, like one row or two row, in terms of precision? Yep. All right, I'll start with the first one. So obviously the LiDAR uh, is influenced by the speed because it's a line scanner, the image or the information is created as you move. So uh, we uh, have pretty accurate measurement of the speed based on the GPS, wheel and colors and all the technologies that we use. Uh, but so that correct for that. So the only limitation, if you were like, normally we use this at walking speed, like uh, f uh, four to six kilometers per hour. And that's normally we get this type of resolution of two to, to five millimeters uh, per uh, resolution, spatial resolution at the plot level. Uh, so uh, if you were to move much faster, then you will decrease your longitudinal you know, resolution. But normally it's not a problem. So the system takes into account your speed. So if you move faster, if you stop, you keep going, that's not that doesn't affect the quality of the like that. In terms of the resolution, uh, how that we, we translate to plots, uh, that's the process we're doing right now, is transla uh, extracting the information from um, full plots to single rows. And what we see is because we achieve, I mean, this is a, this is a LiDAR image. This is, this is kind of the resolution we get. We get two to five millimeters resolution. So definitely it's not a problem. Uh, if we go to smaller plots and even if we have heat plots and things like that, the latter will still give you pretty, pretty high accuracy information. Uh, thank you, Bernie, for a very interesting presentation. My, my name is uh, Roberto Quiroz from the International Potato Center. I wonder if you have tried uh, 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 developing a, la a lighter using blue LEDs instead of a laser. Uh, if it, would it be possible to have the same traits that you're measuring with this? The reason I'm asking is because we're using that for measuring chlorophyll fluorescence at uh, six meters, and I wonder if it can be used for other traits. Yeah. So at this stage, the light that we're using is just a commercial lighter system that is uh, used for industrial applications that we repurpose for this application. So. Uh, definitely, uh, my dream would be to have a, a multi-spectral LiDAR with different wavelengths uh, and be able to capture the 3D information. And I know Phenoxpex is working on some of these technologies as well. So there's no reason why you couldn't use any other color uh, or wavelengths that would give 
you specific information. So some of the traits, obviously some of the architectural traits, it doesn't matter which color you use, you can even use infrared. Um, the issue, if you want to use this for monitoring uh, chlorophyll, for example, as we're trying to do, then you need something that is like red in, in the visible range that uh, really, um, you know, give you that information. It would be great to use some of the blue information, uh, green information, so some of the uh, um, photochemical indexes that are available. So yeah, definitely that could be, uh, I mean, I hope someone from the industry can take some of these um, ideas and, and develop sensors that then we can start using for doing our own science. So yeah, definitely it's a good question. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hola, Jose. Great Hola. to see you again. Um, I'm Argelia Lawrence. I work at Arkansas State University. I wanted to ask you about PhenoSmart. Yep. How soon do you think it's going to be available? Well, it's obviously a <laughs> work in progress. Uh, there's a lot of available in terms of the algorithms and, uh, and, and the different pipelines. So a lot of the effort right now is, is kind of rebranding or moving um, or yeah, these, these existing technologies that we have into that si uh, single uh, portal uh, idea. So we're hoping that that will be available r pretty soon, like uh, sometime next year we'll have some beta launch, hopefully that we can invite some people to start testing and, and trying the system before we can make it uh, publicly available. Thank you. Great, thank you very Great, much. Thank you. Okay, well, that was, uh, these were three, two very really, uh, inspiring talks. Now we're going to move on to, before coffee, we have three talks that have been offered for this session, Advances in Plant Phenotyping Technologies. I'd just like to introduce the co-chair of this session, Bettina Berger, who's sitting there, and she will be uh, introducing the talks after coffee. I probably forgot to introduce myself. I'm Matthew Reynolds. <laughs> Um, okay, so the first, oh, one more thing, if you need help for anything, look out for people wearing these jack green waistcoats, or grey, grey or green waistcoats, these people can help you. <laughs>